Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third Line Starling Trimble Lecture of 2024 and the first of this fall season. I'm very happy to welcome you to, you on, to this event on behalf of the American Institute of Physics. It's a very exciting time for AIP's history activities because for the first time in a few years, we have a full staff of historians on board. Uh, in July, we were very pleased to welcome Rebecca Charbonneau and just a couple weeks ago, Anna Dole. And our fourth historian will introduce our speaker and our talk tonight, John. John Phillips, thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, we're very excited uh, this evening to welcome uh, Dr. Larry Principe, our speaker. Uh, Larry is the Drew Prof uh, Professor of the Humanities at Johns Hopkins and the director of the Singleton Center for the Study of Pre-Modern Europe. Uh, he holds doctorates in organic chemistry from Indiana University and the history of science from Johns Hopkins. His research focuses on uh, the history of chemistry and alchemy in the medieval and early modern periods, as well as the history of science and religion. Uh, he's written dozens of articles and 10 books right now, uh, including The Aspiring Adept, Robert Boyle and His Alchemical Quest, Alchemy Tried in the Fire, Starkey, Boyle, and the Fate of Helmontian Chemistry, and The Scientific Revolution, a very short introduction. Uh, all three very heartily recommend. Uh, Larry has received numerous awards over the course of his career, including the Francis Bacon Medal for significant contributions to the history of science, the Pfizer Award from the History of Science Society, uh, a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, the Franklin Lavoisier Prize from the Fondation de la Maison de la Chemie, my apologies to any Francophones, and uh, the History of Chemistry Award from the American Chemical Society, and the uh, St. Albert the Great Prize from the Society of Catholic Scientists. This evening, we'll be hearing about the mysteries of the Bologna Stone, the first artificially produced phosphorus material. Uh, please join me in welcoming Larry Principe. Introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about is um, something that's both historical and chemical. It's my work on something known as the Bologna Stone. But before I start that, I wanted to say a little something about this engraving that I'm showing you here. This is an early 17th century engraving. It's a frontispiece to a collection of alchemical treatises. And I like to use this one um, as an opener uh, simply because it shows some of the uh, issues that I'm going to be talking about. Now, if we analyze this image for a moment, you see that it's divided pretty neatly in half. On this side, you have three alchemical authors sitting there chatting. And behind them are books um, s stored in the 17th century manner with the spines to the back because you want to protect those gilded bindings. But here are their books. On the other side, you see all the instruments of chemistry. And here we have um, the laborer or, I don't know, the graduate student uh, stoking the fire. And so what it's saying is it's dividing up. It's the theory over here, the discussion, and the practice. And what I'm going to talk about today is what happens when theory meets practice or when books meet practicality. How easy is it to replicate a recipe that's written in a book? And what are the kind of theories that you get out from doing it? And part of my um, motto when I talk about the history of chemistry is that history of chemistry has been, from its beginnings in Greco-Roman Egypt, um, a union of head and hand, of theory and practice. You really can't do one without the other. People tell me there are theoretical chemists in the world. I don't really believe it. You really have to have the two. All right, so the work I do as a historian of pre-modern chemistry is essentially interdisciplinary, combining historical and scientific methods, because each area contributes its own insights from its own methods to answer particular research questions that straddle the border between the humanities and the sciences, as are, or should be, the topics that are properly called the history of science. And now I'm going to say, that I am one of those unfortunately becoming rarer individuals who believe that if one is going to talk about the history of science meaningfully, one ought to know at least a little bit about the science. Um, so I'm going to begin by explaining what the Bologna Stone is and why it's important, then talk about its history. 
Next, I'll turn towards resolving my research question, namely, why is it that preparing the Bologna stone turned out to be so difficult to reproduce reliably in the 17th century, despite the multiple publications of the method, and despite the fact that the chemical transformation required is chemistry 101, if even that. So my methodology here involves working both in archives and in the laboratory. Um, so there are two general features of early modern chemistry I should mention. The first is the central place that's played by materials, and the second is the importance of secrecy. Um, the importance of materials dates back to the earliest days of chemistry, as I've said, this, this union of head and hand, of practice and theory. Um, and secrecy also dates from alchemy's earliest days. It was carried over from its origins in artisanal practices, where you had to keep secrecy because there were trade secrets that had a, a value to them. Well, the Bologna stone represents an example of both materials and secrets. It's one of a class of material substances that do not belong to the ordinary items of commerce, but rather to a group of substances that carry what might be called philosophical value. These substances were not, or were not obviously, of any commercial value or utility whatsoever. They had only value because they were curiosities. That is, they displayed some unusual or wonderful properties that promised to reveal something about the hidden workings of the natural world. As such, their market was limited to natural philosophers, and they fervently sought after these kind of exotic materials. And I call them chemical exotica, because they resembled, in more ways than one, the natural and artificial exotica that, so, that was sought by collectors of the period to fill their cabinets of curiosities. Um, in fact, if you saw the little piece of Bologna stone I have outside, I have my own little cabinet of curiosities at home, and that's where that lives. Um, now, because these materials had to be produced, they also involved secrecy, namely, how do you make them? And such knowledge was limited to a small number of chemists, or even just one, and so trade in exotic chemical materials included both the materials themselves and the knowledge of how to make them. And so, just like with the, the work of an artisan, the more difficult the preparation, the more valuable the object. Well, what is the Bologna stone? It was a chemical wonder of the 17th century. Today, it's recognized as the first artificially produced phosphor, a material that, after being exposed to light, glows in the dark, a phenomenon we now call persistent luminescence. Well, around 1603, um, a Bologna shoemaker and hopeful alchemist named Vincenzo Casciarolo picked up some stones in the hills south of his hometown of Bologna. Hoping that they contained precious metal or might be able to produce the philosopher's stone, he brought them home and began experimenting with them. He tried smelting precious metals from them, but they produced neither gold nor silver. Although they did, to his astonishment, once they were cooled off and he carried them into a dark room, they glowed in the dark, like a glowing coal, he says. Well, soon news of what became known as the solar stone, because it would glow like the sun, or the sponge of light began to spread. And some prepared stones were given to the professor of mathematics and astronomy at Bologna, um, Giovanni Antonio Maggini, who learned the preparation and distributed them. Some of them he sent to no, other, no person less than Galileo, who was fascinated by them about what, in regard to what they might tell us about the nature of light. Galileo showed his to his friend, the Jesuit priest, Giulio Cesare la Galla, who first mentioned them in print in 1612, where he wrote, quote, it is necessary that they be burned skillfully in the fire in order to glow. In 1622, a longer account appeared from the pen of Pierre Potier in his Pharmacopoeia Spagirica. He's a French physician who was living in Bologna. He reported where the stones are found, how to find them, and described two methods for making them luminescent. He said that you can powder the stone, put the powder in a crucible, put it in the fire, 
or you can form the powder into little cakes with water and expose them to the fire for five hours. Further publications of the process occurred later in the century. I've got another one there. Um, here in 1634, Ovidio Montalbani, a natural philosopher in Bologna, um, rip, um, published this pamphlet about the stones and their preparation. And he tells here that he and his co colleague, Carlo Antonio Manzini, prepared what they call a very large quantity of these stones um, by calcining the stones whole, not in powder like Potier says, but calcining them whole. And here we can see an example in this engraving. You can see here the stones being burned in a fire. Uh, in fact, many of, the, many of the samples that were exchanged and traded all over Europe came from the laboratory of Montalbani and Mancini. Uh, in fact, the English diarist John Evelyn visited, made a special point of going to visit Montalbani in Bologna to get some of the stones, which he brought back to England, and one of them he gave to his friend Robert Boyle, who wrote about them. Um, notably, Montalbani and Mancini were not at all secretive about the process. It was published in the pamphlet I just showed you, and there was another folio volante, as they are called, a flying leaf, in other words, a pamphlet that was published telling people how to do it. I've looked and looked and looked for a copy of this folio volante and never been able to find a surviving one. This is the problem of ephemeral productions in the early modern period. I mean, it's a sheet of paper. What do you do with a sheet of paper? You know, you use to wrap fish or something. Um, and so rarely have these uh, ephemera survived. So at, at least I have never found a copy of it. I'm still looking, though. So given these multiple publications, the way of making the stone glow was not a secret. But no one could get it to work. Even some who had watched Montalbani prepare the stones, like the visitor from Germany, Christian Menzel, could not replicate the process on his own. Quote, I was not able to make luminous stones, even though I burned up a lot of charcoal at Bologna, he writes. Now, this consistent failure led some people to believe that the real process had been kept secret and was now lost. In 1666, the Philosophical Transactions of London lamented, quote, the loss of the way to, to prepare the Bolognian stone, for even though several persons have pretended to know the art of preparing it, no one can do it. Another source declared that the only person to have the true secret was, quote, an ecclesiastic who is now dead without having left that skill to anyone. In the same year, the astronomer Adrien Ozu, who was then in Italy, reported, quote, the priest who had the secret has died. No one knows anymore how to calcine it so as to retain light. And finally, another person wrote, as for the famous Bolognian stone, it is now to be found only in books. Well, the dissonance between published recipes and the practical failures has long been glossed over in the secondary literature. Um, ironically, one reason for this is the attention that more modern chemists have given to the process. Sometimes help is not really helpful. Well, the chemical identity of the starting material, the starting mineral, as barium sulfate, was discovered by Schiele in 1744. And it was by studying this mineral that he identified for the first time barium compounds as something different from calcium. So once the chemical composition of the mineral was known and the persistently luminescent character of barium sulfide was recognized in the late 19th century, it was easy for 20th century authors uh, to write something like this, to asserting that the glowing Bologna stone was prepared by a simple reduction of the native mineral barium sulfate to the luminescent material, barium sulfide. Well, that was either because these commentators could scarcely imagine so simple an operation could ever have been difficult, or because they dismissed 17th century uh, problems as the result of supposedly primitive character of early chemical practitioners. And so the persistent failure to create the Bologna stone in the 17th century disappeared from view. But anybody, anybody who has worked in a laboratory, probably most of you have at one point or another, knows that processes that look really simple on paper are rarely so in practice. 
Moreover, as I've tried to show, the experimental prowess of early modern chemists was simply extraordinary in many circumstances. They could do things with a charcoal fire, a gl soft glass vessels, poor quality reagents, that even we, even I, with thermostatically controlled heat sources, Pyrex glass, and commercially available reagents can find extremely difficult. So the question is, why all the failures in the 17th century? Was there really a hidden secret? Was there some unarticulated trick needed for the operation? And why is it that only the, the only successful people were the ones in Bologna? Well, these questions would be difficult to answer with any confidence if it weren't for the researches of one of the most talented, influential, and remarkable chemists of the late 17th century, a character almost entirely forgotten in the modern literature, even though he was, for decades, the most celebrated and respected chemist in Europe. And his name was Wilhelm Homberg. And today he needs some introduction. And now for a moment of grotesque self-promotion. I actually wrote a book about him. Um, this is not Homberg on the cover here. Uh, we know that his portrait was painted twice by the royal portraitists of France. And both of those portraits have gone missing. By, by very important artists, by the way. So they might be somewhere in some museum identified, you know, as portrait of an unknown scholar. All right, so let me introduce you to my friend, Herr Homberg. Well, he was unusual from the very start. He was born in 1653 on the island of Java to a German war refugee father and a Dutch mother. In Wilhelm's youth, the family returned to Europe. He was sent to study law. He graduated in 1676 from Leipzig and began to work as a lawyer in Magdeburg. Now, going to Magdeburg was both good from his point of view and bad from his family's point of view because he met the Bürgermeister of Magdeburg, who was none other than Otto von Göricke, famous as um, uh, 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 not only a showman, but a person who studied the vacuum and various other physical phenomena. Homburg was fascinated by the things he saw from von Göricke. You may be familiar with the Magdeburg spheres, this famous example of air pressure, where uh, Göricke made two closely fitting iron hemispheres, used an air pump to pump the air out of them, and then showed that teams of horses couldn't pull them apart. Then he goes over, opens the valve, lets the air in, and hits it with a rod, and the two just fall apart on their own. Uh, he was a tremendous showman, and Homberg learned this from him. Well, as a result, Homberg left the law, began to travel, seeking out and trading scientific knowledge and secrets, especially the kind of chemical exotica I mentioned at the start. In 1679, for example, he traveled to Berlin to meet Johann Kunkel, traded some secret or other with him, and became only the third person in history to know the secret of how to make white phosphorus from human urine, which put him in great stead. Everyone wanted to know how to do that, uh, believe it or not. He amassed so great a store of knowledge and wonders that he became, without any formal scientific training, the chief chemist of the French Royal Academy of Sciences, a privileged and esteemed figure in the court of Louis XIV and perhaps the most influential chemical theorist of the early 18th century. Well, Homberg was especially interested in the interaction of light with matter. So he went around looking for anything that might teach him something about that. And it's likely that he gave up the practice of the law, much to his family's chagrin, left Magdeburg to travel to Bologna, perhaps at the urging of Otto von Goerike, who was inter to find out something about the Bologna stone. We have no account of what happened when a 25-year-old Wilhelm Homberg arrived in Bologna in 1678, but he learned how to make the Bologna stone luminescent. And with further experimentation, he learned how to do so better and more reliably than anyone else had ever done. When he showed the stones to the French Academy of Sciences, they recorded that they were, quote, incomparably brighter than the ordinary ones. Well, Homberg never published anything on his own about the Bologna stone. Instead, he gave his results to Nicolas Lendry, who inserted Homberg's reports about it in the 1690 edition of his famous Cours de Chimie, which you have 
on display out there. There, Lemery writes, Monsieur Humbert, the German gentleman, it's interesting, he's calling him the German gentleman here, because he was such a lover of uh, exotica, he tried to make himself into sort of an exotic person, and so he went around calling himself the Indian virtuoso, because he had been born in Java. Um, uh, Emily, he says, the German gentleman has not only recently brought to light this stone that has been nearly forgotten, but has gone far beyond everything that has been published about it. And there is Homberg's uh, procedure laid out in fine detail. He first cleans the stones with a file to get all the dirt and crud off of them, soaks them in spirit of wine, covers them in a powder that he made by grinding other Bologna stones. Um, he says he figured this out because he was carrying a bunch of stones in a box um, from Bologna to somewhere else, and he noticed that they rubbed together, and it's actually quite a soft stone, and so they got covered with the powder of the stones from jostling. And he said that when those, he burned those, they work better than anything else. So what he would do is he would take some small stones, grind them up into powder, and coat the larger stones with the powder, and then put them in a specially designed furnace. Okay, and there it is. All right, so how did Homburg serve the, solve the problem? Well, it turns out there's not just one problem, there are many problems. Well, like so many discoveries, it began by Homberg taking notice of an accident. And I uncovered his surprising discovery by finding in the archives of the French Academy of Sciences this autographed memoir, which you can see up here, he read on the 12th of May in 1694 to the academicians. He's such a good storyteller, I'm just going to quote in extenso from this. After having calcined and rendered luminous a great quantity of these stones in more than a hundred different operations, both in Italy and elsewhere, I wanted to calcine in Paris some of the stones that I had brought raw from Italy. But I did not succeed, and I did not know to what to attribute this failure. I repeated the process ten times in a row with the closest attention, and yet it never worked. What chagrined me even more was that I had promised to teach one of my friends the method of making the stones luminous, and he was pressing me strongly every day to keep my word. After many excuses, I ran into this friend one day on the street in his neighborhood, and he took me by the hand and led me to his house and showed me some raw Bologna stones and a furnace which he had made according to the design I had given him, all the time seriously begging me to make the stones luminous in front of him. Being thus pressed, and seeing that I could not escape, I began again the operation which had so often failed, and to speak the truth, I was trembling all the time, for I had not told him that I had always failed at it in Paris. When the operation was finished, I found the stones the most brilliant and luminous that I had ever seen. My astonishment was enormous, for I had changed nothing in the operation. After having examined everything well, I found no difference, except that in this last operation, I used a bronze mortar to grind the powder which is used in the process in place of the iron mortar which I had used in my laboratory in Paris. So Homburg goes home, gets rid of his iron mortar, he gets a bronze mortar, and it works for him. Never one to let an observation go unstudied, Homburg embarked on a series of combinatorics. He ground the powder in vessels made of different materials. He gathered mortars made of glass, wood, marble, agate, bronze, and iron. He used a copper bowl, a pewter dish, and a silver platter to make the powder. What he defined? He found that the bronze mortar and the copper bowl gave the best results. When he took all the powders that he had ground in the different vessels and ground them again in the bronze mortar, they all gave brightly luminescent stones, except for the powder that had been ground first in iron. He thus concluded that the least bit of iron rubbed off from an iron mortar during grinding entirely prevented the stones from phosphorescing. Here, in 1684, what Homburg has discovered is that iron is what is now called a luminescent poison. 
This sensitivity to iron partly explains the failure of so many attempts. A lot of workers probably used an iron mortar. If you're going to grind a rock, you're going to use a really hard mortar. You're not going to mess up your nice bronze one, right? And that would have contaminated the stones. Or uh, the iron furnace, they used iron furnaces with iron grates. By good fortune, probably only because it, would ha was hap what hap it was what happened to be available, Homburg used a brass grate in his furnace and made the furnace out of clay. Homburg's, com combin combin yeah. Homburg's combinatorics excuse me, also indicated something more important, that an equally minute quantity of copper introduced by grinding in the bronze mortar enhanced the luminescence. What did he discover? It's what we now call doping. He also discovered that while a, by grinding samples of a, what he did was he, would, he took the bronze mortar and he would grind for one minute that used that powder, grind it for two minutes, used that powder, grind it for three minutes, used that powder, and he found that while a little bit of copper enhanced the luminescence, a lot of it destroyed the luminescence. And in fact, what we know now is that the copper dopant, just this is typical, like with making semiconductors, it's the same principle. You only need a trace, 0.005 to 0.02 percent of copper for the, luminesc for the persistent luminescence. These two facts that Homburg discovered in the 1680s were rediscovered independently only in the 1890s. In fact, they had to be the fact that they had to be rediscovered independently points to the very uneven transmission of experimental results over time. As a further example, here is a paper that was published in 2012 announcing the discovery that the luminescence of the Bologna stone is due to trace amounts of copper, which is something that Homburg recognized and demonstrated experimentally in 1684. Okay, to give credit where credit is due to these, um, these, these uh, Finnish, I think, experimenters, um, they did determine the exact mechanism for the recombination of the electrons with uh, a copper nucleus, or a copper ion, I should say. But, um, of course, copper uh, ions and electrons were not something that uh, Homburg knew about. In fact, I was thinking when I was writing this paper, I've looked through so many of Homburg's records. He saw so many things that could not possibly ex be explained. Uh, for example, he is the first person, I, I can argue, who noticed that carbon dioxide absorbs infrared. And he did it by using a burning lens, measuring the temperature, and then passed the beam of light through the vapors coming out of burning charcoal and noticed that the temperature was not as high. So, but before you knew about carbon dioxide, infrared, and uh, uh, light absorption, but this just is another example of how interested he was in this idea of how does light interact with matter. All right. Well, the need for copper and the problem of iron contamination are not the only problems. Homburg also solved a bigger problem but again, in this case, without knowing it. And I recognized this issue only when I tried to replicate his process. And to do that, I had to find the Bologna stone. All right. Well, I got the 1622 edition of Pierre Potier's uh, ph pharmacy, Spagyric Pharmacy, because there he gives instructions in very clear Latin about how to find the stones. He says, you go to the Porta San Mammolo on the west side of Bologna. Here's what the Porta San Mamolo looked like at the beginning of the 20th century. Unfortunately, it looks like this now. Um, even though the, the gate is gone, it's still called the Porta San Mamolo. Go down the street. He says, leave the city on that route. And here's his Latin up here. Um, two roads go to the said mountain, a high road and a low road. And then he says, well, you take the high road, and you keep going until you find a place where the tops of the hills are fertile and green, and the lower parts are completely barren. And I thought, what on earth would that look like? I had no idea. And before I was confident enough or foolhardy enough to rent a car and drive in Italy, I took buses to do this, and finally 
came upon something like this, where you can see these are erosion gullies. These are called calanchi in Italian. Um, and because they're constantly eroding, nothing can grow there. So it's sterile below and, and uh, top. So he says, OK, be careful because it's, 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 it's treacherous footing. And yes, um, I have a witness here who can tell, can tell you about the danger of trying to crawl through these calanchi because they're very slick. Um, here's an aerial view of them. But here you can see very clearly the verdant green Bologna Hills in the back and this completely barren landscape. And then Poitier just says, well, look for a small gray stone. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're all small gray stones. So this, uh, had I not done this, I would have thought, well, what on earth made the cobbler pick up a stone? Because only one in 10,000 or, or fewer of these is actually barite. The rest is calcite and, and other minerals. Well, if you picked up the stone out there, you'll see it's really heavy, really heavy. Um, in fact, barium comes from the Greek word for heavy, because it's, 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 it's a heavy element in mineral. Right, so after a few, after learning, actually, honestly, I went once and found one. This was the first one I found. I went back another time to get more, and I brought home two kilos of the wrong mineral. So it was the third time that I was able to do it right. OK. So bring those home, um, and it's time to make the furnace. And there's the book that you saw out there. Um, shameful of librarians not to see, see me putting, a, putting my, my, my 17th century books on my workbench with clay. All right. Um, so there it is. There's the furnace I made. Um, I used a memoir that Homberg left in the archives of the Academy for making the furnace. I will ask you now, just look at this for a moment. You'll see that my furnace, even forget the fact that I'm a bad potter, um, my furnace doesn't look exactly like the engraving. Just think about what the differences are. All right, um, now set it up. Here it is. It helps to live in a Victorian house where you have a hearth. Uh, fireplace. So furnace and charcoal, you uh, put the um, charcoal in, heat up the furnace a little bit, put in the rest of the charcoal, there's the stones covered in powder on top, um, and you put a little straw in underneath and light it. And it will sit there and burn for about an hour. And once it's done, um, You'll notice something. I'll, I'll show you another picture of the flames in a moment because that was a, that was a key discovery of doing it this way. Um, I should say while you're watching, relaxing, watching the fire. Um, uh, I also discovered that getting the right kind of clay was really important because I had a lot of furnaces that exploded before they got to this point. In fact, I have the burn marks on the floor <laughs> to prove it. Um, all right. So after the fire goes out, you let it cool, and you brush away the ashes, and you'll find a stone like this. Here it is in the light. Expose it to sunlight for a few minutes. Turn off the lights, and there it is, Glow glowing like a burning coal. Well, on the first operation, only one of the five stones proved luminescent. With experience, I managed to get about an 80% success rate and by improving a number of things. One was using up the first bag of charcoal and getting a different brand which had more oak charcoal in it, burned at a higher temperature, gave a better uh, transformation. Um, but when I tried the calcination methods of uh, others, not Homberg's, Pottier, Licetti, they all failed. So what's right about Homberg's calcination? Well, let's reconsider the reaction that we want to have happen. Something has to act as a reducing agent here. And almost every chemical explanation of the 20th century says that the original workers mixed charcoal with the stones. I have yet to find a 17th century text where they mixed charcoal with the stones. And I tried it, and it never works. You never get a luminescent stone this way, ever. This is a back, this is armchair, re, what I call armchair reconstruction. Just, oh, this is what they must have done without actually trying it. It just doesn't work. But if you look again at the, the fire, those of you who are, chem who are chemists will notice there's a particular color to the flames. 
They're this peculiar kind of rosy purple. That tells you what's actually burning. It's actually carbon monoxide that's burning those, those flames. And it is carbon monoxide that is the necessary reducing agent for this material. Now, did anyone notice why, the, why my furnace didn't look like the one in the engraving? Go back to it. Exactly. The vents are much smaller. The vents are so small, not enough oxygen can get in to make the charcoal burn completely. So it only burns to carbon monoxide. And under the, under the conditions of 800 degrees centigrade, carbon monoxide, the reaction goes very, very well. In fact, I've demonstrated this in the laboratory with a cylinder of carbon monoxide and nitrogen gas being passed at high temperature over the stone. And that works. So, you know, if Homburg had made the, the uh, if you have too much oxygen, it goes in just in the wrong direction, the reaction. Um, so if Homburg had made the vents a little bit larger, his might not have worked either. So look, now we have three problems. We have the problem of iron contamination. We have the problem that you need some copper. We have the problem that it has to be done in the right kind of furnace. Now, Lichetti and um, um, Poitier said that they succeeded with a crucible full of the powder. OK, maybe they did. What they didn't tell you, what must have happened, is they must have taken the crucible and stuffed it in the middle of the burning coal so that it was completely surrounded by burning coals, not sitting up on top, which is the way we would normally do it, right? but buried in the middle where there could have been an atmosphere containing enough carbon monoxide. So that could have worked. That's the way they could have done it. But they didn't mention that probably because they didn't think it was important. All right. Um, it turns out that there's yet one more factor, which again I discovered only when I visited the area around Bologna. That is an incredibly fine degree of locality for finding the right stones. And let me explain what I mean. I did find a couple kilos of barite near Monte Paderno, which is where uh, the cobbler found his and where most people went. But barite's a, fair, it's a very, very common mineral uh, worldwide. It's extremely common. Um, most, in most parts of the world, is so contaminated with iron, you could never make a persistently luminescent per, uh, product out of it. However, the Italian stuff in this area around Bologna and Emilia Romagna um, is remarkably free of iron. There are various geological reasons for this. But the same kind of Kalanki can be found in three or four other locales just a few kilometers away from Bologna. Here, Kalanki near the town of Monteveglio. And I went there as well and found a couple more kilos of a beautifully crystalline uh, Bologna stone in the Kalanki of Monteveglio. Now, um, Actually, calcining the stone by Homburg's method is pretty laborious. And even my best furnaces only last about four firings before they shatter. So there's a quick way that I've been used, that I was using when I was doing the experimentation of reducing them in a current of carbon monoxide um, and then looking at their uh, fluorescence in UV. And the fluorescence in UV generally follows pretty well the persistent luminescence. So that would give me a hint of what I'm doing. Now I'll show you some interesting pictures from my lab. I hope they're interesting. Here are two um, examples of ground stone. Over here you have the stone picked up in Monte Padero. This is both barite. They look just the same. This is barite ground in a porcelain mortar, so I'm not adding any copper to it. This is the Monte Velio stone ground in porcelain. Both have been reduced now to barium sulfide. So we'll, we'll let me just put a put, little footnote there. They have, there has to be a level of melting in order to get persistent luminescence because you need a crystal lattice. So when it's done with just the powders, you don't get persistent luminescence. You'll just get the uh, fluorescence. But if I were to take these powders and really heat them and melt them down, we would get the persistent luminescence. Anyway, check out the fluorescence. The Monte Paderno stone has enough copper trace in it. 
but the mineral just a few kilometers away has none. And so no matter what you did to this, no matter how you calcined it, it was never going to make a persistently luminescent mineral. Except, here's the same stone, piece of, this is, these are two pieces off the very same rock. Here it is, if I grind it in bronze, it do the same thing. So fourth problem, either you get a stone by chance that has enough copper in it, or you have to add the copper accidentally by grinding it in the mortar. So now you can see four problems that you would have never expected in what seems to be a very simple chemical reaction. All right, so let me just conclude then. Oh, I should say, because I'm a chemist and I'm an old-fashioned chemist, I actually took some of the Monte Paderno stone and did good old-fashioned wet separative analysis. And I have in my lab a little vial with a beautiful blue crystal of copper sulfate that I extracted from a stone from Monte Paderno. So you could actually, I should have brought a picture of it. It can actually be seen. All right. So the conversion of the native barium sulfate to a persistently luminescent barium sulfide, although it's theoretically very simple, it's so sensitive and so subject to so many variables that it's no wonder that 17th century workers had so much trouble replicating it to the extent that most gave up and considered that the secret had been lost. The lesson is that chemical processes, even simple ones, turn out to be far more complicated in practice than one would really imagine. And this is often be the case because of subtle or unnoticed differences in materials, the wrong kind of clay, the wrong kind of charcoal, an iron rather than a brass mortar or grate, a material sourced from the wrong locale. And in the case of chemical exotica, part of the reason they are exotica is that they're hard to prepare. And their value comes in part not only from their alluring properties like glowing in the dark, but also from the aura of mystery that surrounds their preparation. And Homberg's also, results also explain why, although barite is a fairly common mineral found all over the world, only the Bologna mineral near Monte Paderno can become luminescent on its own. Only the Italian barite from that specific locale contains no iron and the essential trace of copper. Had Vincenzo the cobbler lived anywhere other than Bologna, he might still have found the same heavy glittering minerals but it would never have become persistently luminescent. So for some materials, being in the right place is crucial. It's easy to forget how contingent material processes really are. Even the simplest chemical reactions can be surprisingly complex. Consider, for a moment, the enormous variation in materials, purity, particle size, origin, and so forth, and the more obscure factors like scale, does it do work as the same on a milligram as it does on a ton? Probably not in most cases. Climate, the reactivity of vessels and instruments. When you think of all that, I just sometimes sit back and I think, you know, it's amazing that anything beyond the most trivial chemical reaction actually works the same way twice. Good practicing chemists are usually aware of this fact, but take the next step, this awareness needs also to be part of the historical studies of chemical materials. It should prevent us from over-abstracting and over-intellectualizing chemical work at the expense of its manual and material dimension. I say that, and I mean it, but I also know that there's some danger of going too far with that, that model. There is, as many of you know, a current focus within the history of science on materials and what is called material culture. And sometimes this leads to what I will call unnecessarily materialistic conclusions. When the focus is too narrowly on commercial or social aspects, it's possible to overlook or minimize the intellectual. Homberg's exotic materials had no utilitarian or commercial value. They were valued for what they could say about the hidden workings of nature, and simply for the pleasure, the pleasure that they give to the intellect. These materials that he had, the Bologna stone, white phosphorus, and many other substances, all formed part of his long-term fascination with the interaction of light and matter. 
and his interest in this topic led him to focus on collecting, preparing, and studying specifically phosphorescent materials. It led him to study optics. It led him to have what may be one of the first examples of big science in terms of an instrument uh, that he worked with in his laboratory, a gigantic burning lens that was a meter in diameter. Um, all of them, in turn, played a combined role in helping him formulate his mature and highly influential theory of combination and reactivity, namely that light could incorporate with ordinary matter and change its properties. For Homberg, the matter of light was the sole source of chemical reactivity in the universe. The function of the sun and the stars was constantly to send forth the matter of light that keeps everything running. They are, in his own words, the engines that power the universe. What is of special interest, at least to me then, is how the material and the intellectual interact, where they meet, where the sensual experience with materials meets the intellectual development of theory. Thus, while Homburg did use materials and secrets to collect new treasures, and he employed them very shrewdly to uh, advance his career, these materials nonetheless exist firmly situated within the context of his larger intellectual program. It is therefore, and this is where I will conclude, it's important to preserve a balance, to maintain in our historical analyses that union of mind and hand, of spirit and material, that constitutes what I consider to be the essential nature of chemistry throughout its history. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, fascinating talk. Uh, we're going to now have a Q&A. Uh, I'm going to abuse my uh, position here with the microphone to ask the first question. Uh, so uh, uh, again, this was fascinating. Uh, and your conclusion, uh, I like how it linked back up to the very opening image with the theoreticians on one side and the technician on the other. Um, I I'm curious uh, if there's any more context you could give on the theoretical significance of the Bologna Stone beyond Homburg's specific interests mm -hmm. in, in light. Uh, any philosophical or theological uh, context that, that these other individuals were trying to, yeah. uh, to calcinate the stone uh, had. Yeah, well, uh, you know, one of the reasons the stones got uh, distributed quickly so early was uh, for Galileo, that he really was at that very time interested in the principles of light. He didn't do very much with it. He got busy with other things. But um, we have, for example, um, the really big volume on the Bologna stone. One person thought that, um, now what is it called? Earthshine, that you see on the moon when you see the dark part illuminated. He was trying to argue that maybe the moon is made of Bologna stone, and this is actually the luminescence of, a persistent luminescence of the, the material of the lunar surface. Um, very few people other, uh, Boyle did some experiments with them. He tried putting them in a vacuum and was astonished that unlike a candle that goes out, when you pump out the air, the Bologna stone keeps, keeps glowing, whether there's air or not. So a lot of people were doing experiments with them. But um, the, one of the problems with the Bologna stone, which I didn't mention, is that it doesn't last. The barium sulfide um, automa uh, oxidizes in air back to barium sulfide. And so a lot of the people who were doing work on this, like Boyle and uh, Robert Southwell at the Royal Society of London, they were in like the worst possible climate to keep the Bologna Stone. You know, cold, wet, English weather. I mean, the Bologna Stone is going to last you a few weeks at most. Um, in Italy, you, you can maybe keep it for a year, but um, they actually fall apart. I, all the ones that I've made, I would have brought one, but they sort of fall into powder at this point. Um, and they smell bad. That's the other thing. Oh, may I pick up on that one, this, the bad smell? So, yeah, so uh, Homburg believed that, um, well, the, the theory of chemistry at the time was that materials were made out of three or five uh, uh, principles, uh, mercury, sulfur, salt, earth, and water. So he thought that, he, what he was trying to do was, look, nobody knows what these things actually are. Are they elements? What are they? We need to get them in pure elemental states. So he said, OK, I'm going to start with sulfur. And he tries to find the sulf this unique sulfur principle that's in everything. And he says, the more I looked for it, the less I could find it. It's a very long story. It's in my book, if you're interested. Um, he finally decides that the matter of light 
is the same thing as sulfur. And that that's what's incorporating with matter and making it active. And one of the reasons he comes to this conclusion is something that I noticed that he never mentioned. When you get a bologna stone that's really, really bright, it really stinks of sulfur. As if the emission of sulfur and the emission of light are somehow connected. Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on the role of secrecy mm. surrounding these sorts of cabinet of curiosity items. Did you ever find any evidence of someone who knew how to make this type of stone deliberately try to hide the recipe or, or other context for these types of objects? Yeah, I can, give you a, I can give you a really good example from Humberg himself. So I mentioned he was the third person to know how to make white phosphorus. Everybody wanted to know how to make white phosphorus. It was, it was a real wonder in the late 17th century. He knew how to do it, and he could do it. And when he arrived in Paris, he showed samples of his phosphorus to the members of the academy. And they're like, whoa. But he would never tell them how to do it until he was made a member of the academy with a stipend. And his first presentation was on the way of making white phosphorus. So he was very clever. He wasn't just going to give away the secret for nothing. He learned that from Otto von Goerike. He said, von Goerike says in one of his books, what benefit is it to me if I just give away what I've learned when it took me so much time and money to learn it? So what's going on in this time is there's definitely a, an exchange. And we find Boyle saying, you know, there are, there's one place in Boyle's notes where he says, I know some things that I don't publish, that I won't tell anyone about, just so that I can keep a few secrets to trade with people, other people who have secrets. And this is essentially what Homberg did for the first eight years of his career. He would go to one place and learn how to do something, how to make something, and then he would go to the next town where that wasn't known. He'd say, eh, I'll tell you what I learned over there. You tell me what you know. And he gradually built up this sort of treasure chest of secrets that he could use like currency. To, to trade other things. So when he finally got to Paris, the academicians were like, wow, this guy knows everything. <laughs> Unfortunately, he had, it, it took him a while to get into the academy because of political problems, but um, he did eventually. We still have time for more questions. Uh, I don't know how often you have the chance to ask questions of an expert on alchemy, but. <laughs> So I, I really enjoyed how you described um, it being intellectual pleasure that drove a lot of the interest in the Bologna Stone. I think I think yeah. we don't talk about that enough in history. I know. So I really enjoyed Absolutely. that. Yes. Ah. Uh, you know, it's not all this crass materialism and money making and social negotiating. Blah blah blah. You know, sometimes people are just like, wow. Right, and so this is this leads me to my question, which is maybe a, like a slightly feminine in nature question, which is to say, when I think about rocks, special rocks and pleasure, I think about fashion, I think about j gemstones and jewels. So I'm curious, did the Bologna stone stay in the realm of intellectuals, natural philosophers in this period, or did it gain value because of its be inherent beauty? I imagine that there, would, there were people who would pay handsomely to have one. Hmm. I mean, Boyle tried to get one after the one that was brought back to him by Evelyn no longer glowed. Um, but there just, there just weren't any. There weren't any around. Um, I mean, curiously enough now, when I first went to Bologna, um, I thought, well, maybe I can just go to the mineral shop. Maybe I can just go there. <laughs> and I said, I'm looking for, you know, Bologna stone barrack. He said, eh, who wants that? It's an ugly gray rock. <laughs> um, you know, so nobody, not, nobody's going to buy that. <laughs> So go find it yourself, basically, he told me. <laughs> yeah. That's so interesting. So you really didn't know where to look exactly. Because I would have thought that maybe they were all um, harvested because of that fascination of the 17th century. So they were just there lying on the hillside. There really was no interest before, between yeah, now well, and then. Well, you know, people tried. I mean, Goethe went to try and get yeah. one. Um, so throughout the 18th century, people were picking them up. The benefit of the matter is that um, the Kalanki are constantly eroding. Oh, right. So you're always exposing. I, I don't know that anyone's picked up a Bologna stone, <laughs> you know, in my lifetime sure, sure. or in this in the past century. But uh, yeah, you could you could find them. It takes a little doing. Um, a lot of picking up rocks, feeling them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, after a while, after you've been looking at them, like any kind of practice, yeah. you can say, oh, 
right there. They're, they're a little bit shinier, they're a little bit smoother. Um, so yeah, you can find them. And often what happens is they, they, they sometimes can uh, occur together in the kind of conglomerate. And so once, the, um, once they start eroding out, they sort of tumble down the calanco. And so if you find one at the bottom, it's like, okay, this one is here. Let me climb at risk of my life up this gully. And then usually you can find three or four more like in a line. Fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, agreed. Fascinating talk. Um, and uh, at a couple points, you sort of talked about sort of comparing and contrasting some of your approach with where things are going in the history of science in general, you know, in materiality, a, a number of those. And so I'm just curious if you could give a few more comments about sort of how you – things that you think it would be more important for the field to be attending to more broadly that sort of are illustrated by the, the study yeah. um, and your work more generally? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, a part of it is a demographic shift that I've seen over the time of my career that um, at one point a lot of people who went into the history of science came out of science and engineering backgrounds. Um, and, you know, the historians often sort of look down their noses at us because usually a lot of people who went into history is because they didn't like science. And so, um, got stories. Um, anyway, um, and, and that has changed to a considerable extent. And I am, I'll be blunt with you, I, I think that bringing in certain new approaches to the history of science has been extremely valuable over the last, let's say, 30 years, that we've been looking at a lot of things that we hadn't looked at before. I mean, even alchemy, right? Nobody, nobody wanted to look at alchemy when I started, right? When I started telling people I'm working on alchemy at a cocktail party, you could, it was that one of those moments where the ice stops clinking in the glasses and everybody sort of goes off into, away from you. Um, but. I'm concerned that things have gone too far in the sense that um, there's not as much science and technology in the history of science and technology as there needs to be in order actually to speak knowingly about history and culture. And I think that's bad, personally. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, I was just wondering if, if Humberg or um, his contemporaries had any uh, theories about how the rocks came to be, mm. you know, um, and, and what might have imparted their qualities to them. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. I have not seen anything like that. No, so some kind of idea of why these are the way they are. No, I know. I mean, Humberg eventually just thought, he, he just thought that there was a particularly uh, loosely attached sulfur in the, in these, and then you heat them, and then it emits, and you see that as light. But that's all. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for the questions, uh, and uh, our director, Bill Thomas, has a few concluding comments. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, Larry, for that wonderful talk. I, You're welcome. It was absolutely terrific. Thank you. So. Our next and final Trimble Lecture of the Year is going to be on Friday, not the usual Wednesday, on Friday, October 11th, right here in this space at ACPDC. Uh, it's going to be Michelle Janssen from the University of Minnesota, and he's going to be talking about Lucy Mensing, Forgotten Qu Quantum Pioneer. So we hope uh, we will see you then. Thank you very much. <laughs>